is a long-term. Oh yeah, thank you. Just said it. This is being recorded, by the way, so that anything you, if you want to repeat it or let other people know who couldn't make it, uh, it will be linked to our webpage, as most of our other programs are linked to our webpage. So, um, the same Dr. Bernice Lerner is a long-term, long-time, um, per you know, uh, instructor and uh, researcher in adult education, and she was, uh, among other things, she was dean of adult learning at Hebrew College and uh, she's director of this for the Center of the Advancement of Ethics and Character at Boston University. She's lectured uh, and consulted widely around the, around the world really, including in Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, many other, a number of other places. Um, she is, um, she has a bat, just to give her a bachelor's degree from sunny Stony Brook, master's from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and uh, her doctorate in education at, from Boston University. Uh, so uh, she's, you know, been a long time um, person involved in, obviously, in education, especially working with adults. Um, but she's also, this is what our talk is, she's the author of Horrors of War, which is an amazing book dealing with, as you'll hear, her, uh, her mother's experience being liberated in Belsen, Bergen, Bergen-Belsen uh, by a, um, and, and her involvement with a British doctor. Um, and so uh, we're really happy to be able to uh, welcome Dr. Benice Lerner. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, so uh, it's really a privilege to be addressing the Brost Bristol Community College community. Um, I live not that far. I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I, if you would have had live presentations, I would have come down, but I'm happy to do this virtually. And I just want to say that I don't know all of you in the audience, and I don't know your backgrounds, but um, if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to ask. I'm going to give you sort of a quite an intense presentation, but after it, I will take any questions from anyone and don't, if you're not familiar even with the Holocaust or don't hesitate to ask. You can put but, them um, in the chat, right? Put them in the chat, chat that would be great. Right. And maybe Ron, you could then pick, you know, choose them and ask. Yeah, them. we'll have a Q and A after the, the Q &A presentation. Q and A after right. would be great. Okay. So, um, so I just want to, I will show you in a minute, I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation that I have, but I just want you to just think for a minute about your parents, who, who are your parents, and um, try to imagine that um, what they were like before you came into the picture, what they were like as children and adolescents, and what kinds of experiences might that they have had, and what kinds of characters were they? Um, so these are the kinds of things that I was asking and in order to write this book that I'll tell you about I kind of had to separate myself from being the daughter, my mother's daughter to being this like a try to be this objective researcher and look at who was this child and what was she what did she navigate um, when she was young what was her childhood like and it was very exotic and different from mine I grew up on Long Island New York she grew up in a small Carpathian mountain town in Romania. And, um, and uh, after the war, she had spent 10 post-war years in Sweden where she was a young woman. And um, so she had a lot of adventurous kind of stories to tell me when I was growing up. And only when I was a teenager did she tell me about this uh, cataclysm that happened when she was a teenager and how she went through it. So um, here, I'm gonna share my screen with you now. Um, so um, my presentation is the title of my book, All the Horrors of War. And um, here is my book. On the left side, you see the um, version that was published here in the United States by Johns Hopkins University Press, All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen-Belsen. Uh, my British publisher had the same exact text and images to work with, but you can see that they came up with a different concept for the cover. They called it To Meet in Hell. 
But here you see my mom um, when she was 15 years old, maybe she had just turned 16. And you can see the sort of look in her eyes. She probably was quite depressed and she was really seriously ill. You can see that she's nourished. She's not starving. Yeah. Um, the backdrop of this picture is, um, this was a tuberculosis sanitarium in snowy Northwest Sweden, a place called Arvika. And so this is one of the protagonists in my book, my mom. And my mom told me a lot of stories as I was growing up, but there was one sort of gap in what she was able to tell me, which was how was her life saved? Um, she had been taken to Auschwitz with her family. Everyone was killed except for her and her older sister. Uh, she went through all these uh, incredible trials when she was a teenager. Uh, in the Holocaust. And um, at the end of the war, she wound up in a place called Bergen-Belsen. And she was so sick at the very end of the war that, and that she was really practically at death's door by the time the liberators came in. And uh, really, had they come in just two or three days later, I might not be here to give you this presentation. It was just the situation was so dire. It's really a race against time rescue story. Um, the rescue failed for too many thousands and thousands of people, but for my mom, it was sort of in the nick of time, but she had fallen unconscious toward the end, right after the liberation. She could not tell me precisely how she, her life was saved. So in an effort to uncover the details of how she got from this dung infested hut overcrowded with the living and the dead sharing the same space and her being in such terrible shape to a makeshift hospital room. How did she get from point A to point B? So I dove very deep into the story and I discovered this, the man who led relief efforts at Bergen-Belsen, the British army medical officer who came into the camp and was suddenly in the thick of the war and the fighting in Northwest Germany in charge of trying to save people. And his name was Brigadier Glenn Hughes. And here he is, he was, my mom was um, 15 years old when she was liberated and he was a 52 year old liberator. And I got into both their stories. So how was I gonna tell the story of these two different people? And here is a disclosure right at the outset. They did not meet. I did, it would have been very romantic if they had met and he had adopted her and taken her back to England with him, but nothing like that happened. In fact, it would have been quite extraordinary because he was very high up in the British hierarchy and he was the survivors whom he was dealing with were mostly the people who were strong in their twenties and thirties, some of them who emerged as leaders after the liberation. Um, so those were the ones he really got to know and connect with well. And um, he remained in touch with survivors for the rest of his life. So I became very interested in his story. He was sort of to me, if you're familiar with Oscar Schindler, um, Schindler's yeah. List, the movie and the book, um, Oscar Schindler remained in touch with survivors for the rest of his life. And he really saw his role in the history of the Jewish people and saving a remnant of the Jewish people. And Glenn Hughes thought of himself in the same vein. So how was I gonna tell this story of these two people who didn't know each other? So I decided I was gonna tell it as the race against time rescue story in the last year of the war. So my book has a prologue and an epilogue and sandwiched in between, um, I have the Belzen trial, just a few paragraphs about the Belzen trial. And here's a picture of that trial. It was the first international, first war crimes trial to apply international law to the Nazi criminals. And here you have 44 um, or 45 uh, Nazi SS officers on trial with these numbers hanging from them. And I talk a little bit about the trial because it was really important and because Glenn Hughes served as first witness and as first witness, he set the tone for the case. So you could say that he set the tone for the case of the first law to apply international law. Was that, Nuremberg? Was that the Nuremberg trial? 
No, this was called the Belzen trial, and it immediately preceded the Nuremberg trials. Immediately preceded. In fact, it had to end before the Nuremberg trials were beginning. So it was like this trial was from September 17th to November 17th, 1945. And um, I talk a little bit about this character, Irma Grace, who is number nine, who was a very sadistic SS officer who was only 22 at the trial. She was one of the most evil women and she was called the beautiful blonde beast. No one could figure out how someone so young and pretty had done these heinous deeds really, both in Auschwitz and at Bergen-Belsen. Anyway, so I sandwich it, the, uh, um, the meat of the story between the prologue, epilogue and the Belsen trial. And I talk about the four seasons beginning with April, 1944, the, spr the spring, summer, fall, and winter of 44, 45, and then the spring of 1945, the fifth season, at the point at which my protagonists coming from the east and west of Europe converge in this hellish concentration camp. So I'm just, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm not going to tell you about all the really dramatic wartime events that happened to these two people, like what were the contexts they were navigating, both my mom as a prisoner, uh, the brigadier as a military officer. But I will just point out a couple of things. I'll tell you a little bit about their starting point. And that spring, um, Glenn Hughes was in the Yorkshire Wolves in England preparing for the D-Day invasion. And my mom was at home with her family in Siget. At that time, Siget was part of Hungary. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what happened the day of the D-Day landings, which Glenn Hughes was very much a part of. And my mom was in Auschwitz at that point. And then I'll really describe to you Bergen-Belsen. So the Yorkshire Wolves well, were chosen because the topography resembled that of Normandy, uh, the, the, where the British troops would be fighting. And at this point, Glenn Hughes was director of medical services for the British Army's Eighth Corps, which would go on to see some of the most horrendous fighting in Normandy. And my mom was in Seget. And here's, some real, here's something very sad. We don't have a single photograph of her or anyone in her family from before the war. Nothing. Like I have tried, I've gone to Siget. I've tried to find out, does anyone have any school class pictures? I knew they were taken. Nothing. I came up with nothing. My mother doesn't have a single photograph. I don't know what my grandparents look like. I don't know what her, sister, her sisters and her brother look like. Um, Siget, here's a, it's, here it's a border town. It was on the border of what was Czechoslovakia in the 1930s. In fact, my father is from right near here. Here's my mom. And um, then Hungary was awarded all this territory by Hitler. And Siget was a beautiful town. These are older postcards, but you get sort of, this was even before my mom was born, but you get the feeling that you can, when I went there, you know, the mountains didn't move, right? So I could kind of see like the mountain that she climbed all the time as a kid. And it was just a very beautiful layout. It was just like one of the most charming little towns in, in Carpathian mountain region. And my mom was a really street, street smart kid. Um, she really knew her way around the neighborhood and really just plumbing her memory. One day she sat down and she drew a map of where her house was, uh, where her apartment was, was over here, our apartment. And um, it was between the street called Timar Utsa and Kigyo Utsa. Kigyo Utsa means snake street because it kind of curved around. And um, so she was, they were poor. Her family was really poor. This, this was like a strip of land. When I was there, it went from here to maybe that building over there, just a strip of land where there were all these apartments. And um, yeah, it, it, it always sounded really kind of romantic to me. There were gardens, there were animals, there were, um, there was a lot of activity. There was a very vibrant Jewish life. And here's where some of her friends lived. And she, she described this to me. But anyway, I should just tell you that Ellie Wiesel 
lived right over here. He lived like when I went to visit his house, which is still standing, uh, his family was better off than my, my mom's family. His father was a grocer. It was like a really short walk. It was like two, three minutes from Ellie Wiesel's house to my mom's house. And I'm sure you all know who Ellie Wiesel is, right? Right. If you don't, you can ask him. Anyway, so now, now D Day, June 6, 1944, the most amazing military invasion practically in history 150, um, what was it, 150,000 um, troops landed. All of this armada from the British and the Canadian and the US forces landed on the beaches of Normandy. It was all done on, under secret. And I should just tell you and all the fighting would then be taking place that Glenn Hughes was involved in would be in Cannes area and they would be fighting up through here and trying to go eventually up through France and Belgium and, and uh, Holland and reach the fortress of Germany. But I'm just going to tell you one little fact, and that is that on this day, these, the death toll was half, less than half of what the death toll was in Auschwitz on this one day in history, less than half. And the number the attrition, the number of men who died, soldiers who died decreased even during the very severe fighting in the months to come. But the number uh, of people killed in Auschwitz remained at the same high level, which was more than like 9,000 a day. So here is June 6, 1944. This is the entryway into Birkenau. Birkenau was Auschwitz II. It was, I don't know, a mile and a half from Auschwitz I. Birkenau is um, where there were, where the gas chambers and crematoria were set up. In fact, there was a lot of preparation for the deportation of the Hungarian Jews. The murder of the Hungarian Jews in the spring and summer of 1944 is a world history record. Never were so many people murdered in such a short period of time, never on the face of the earth. It was done factory style. Auschwitz had already been in operation for, for several years, but new preparations were made. Just to give you idea, an idea, the men who were recruited to be in the Sonderkommando, who had the horrific job of taking the people from the gas chamber to the crematoria, of emptying the ante room to the crematoria of possess people's possessions. The Sonder Commando, there were only six Sonder Commando employed, employed. They weren't paid um, uh, as slave laborers in Auschwitz at Birkenau, in Auschwitz in 1940. And by 1944, in preparation for the Hungarian, the incoming of the Hungarians, um, more than 440,000 Hungarians were coming in. Um, that summer, there were a thousand, a thousand Sonder Commando working in the operation. And here's a photograph that was uh, snapped by an SS officer. And there are a few of these. Uh, the Nazis did not want evidence of their crimes to ever become public. So there was no photography, but occasionally there was someone sneaking in the pictures. And if you zoomed in and look close, you could see this is like one of the first, this is the first selection when people got off the cattle trains at the ramp. And it's an incoming transport. You see how they separated the men and the women. And if you, people do not know, everything was done with such great secrecy. People didn't know that within a few minutes they were going to be killed. But you can look, and though it looks like it's very orderly, if you really took a magnifying glass to this picture, you can kind of see some things that are going on. You could maybe see oh, a woman talking to a child or people talking to each other, where are we? And trying to figure out this place. And you see the SS officers who perform the selection. I'm not going to get into the details of what happened in Auschwitz, but you can read a lot about it. Some of it is in my book. And of course, I tell about my mom's, my mom's, um, the shock my mom experienced upon arriving in this alternate planet. Nobody, she had never, my mother had never slept outside of her own home 
she was 14 years old, she had never left her town. So this was, I mean, she had never been anywhere. And then she was taken with her family and under brutal, horrible conditions to this place. So um, this is just, um, I really spent a lot of time in the archives looking at Glenn Hughes's notes. And here's just a few images of the kind of things that he was keeping track of. And you could just see, this is a chart of D-Day, D plus one, D plus two, D plus three, how many casualties there were, what they anticipated. And he was always thinking in terms of numbers, rescue, here's general hospitals, which ones he was able to commandeer, how many beds they had. Uh, special units, uh, all the different medical units that had to come and treat wounded soldiers. And he was very concerned with the evacuation and treatment to, of soldiers. And he was a real stickler for preparedness. His men had to know, and, the, and his women, the nurses had to know how to quickly uh, disassemble field, uh, medical field posts, casualty clearing stations, and they, every, even the surgery was planned down to the last second, how long it would take. And he was masterminding the whole, like he eventually was promoted to deputy director of medical services for the entire British second army. And that was the role he was in when he was told that there was fighting in the vicinity of this concentration camp in Germany and the, it was, and he would, this man who was so prepared for everything was told, even like unusual things. I mean, they knew they'd be coming across some concentration camps and POW camps, but nothing, nothing prepared him for this. Nothing prepared him for the entry into Bergen-Belsen. It was an extraordinary story of how Heinrich Himmler who was very high up in the Nazi hierarchy, who visited Auschwitz, who really, who, who made, gave orders for the more advanced techni uh, technical aspects of the gas chambers in crematoria. The killing couldn't happen fast enough for him. And he was observing the camps and he was talking to the other SS and promote, propping them up. He gave the order on April 12th, 1945, right? This is several weeks before the end of the war, right? Victory in Europe day wasn't until May 8th. On April 12th, the Berrigan Belsen was to be handed over to the allied forces. Why? There was a lot of reasons why, but one, one of them um, was that it was of concern, international concern for reasons of health. There was gonna be fighting in the area and if the inmates were going to break out, there were 60,000 people there. If some of them would break out, they would spread disease into the countryside into the German civilian population. Almost everyone there had typhus. Typhus was in the dust in the camp. Um, at Bergen-Belsen, there was practically no food given to the inmates. They, these were the people, the people who were taken to Bergen-Belsen at the end of the war, mostly arrived at death marches. These were people who had managed to evade the gas chambers in Auschwitz. They had been working in slave labor camps. They had survived death marches. They were in bad shape, but they landed in Bergen-Belsen. This was the Nazis effort to march the surviving inmates as far away from the allied liberators as possible. So as the Russians were coming in from the east, they were evacuating the labor camps and marching the inmates deep, deep into Germany. And in this place in Northwest Germany, in Bergen-Belsen was where mo the majority were deposited. They were deposited other places too, right? Flossenburg, Dachau, other concentration camps. But Bergen-Belsen became the largest dump dumping ground. So my mother um, had been on a death march. Um, you know, in my book, I explain how she survived. I mean, as she was telling me the stories as I was growing up, I mean, she, the kinds of thinking that she did, the kinds of strategies she had made me really sort of think of her as a girl victor against Hitler. 
Um, it took me a long time to write about her because when I got married and she had children, I no longer was a teenager identifying with her. I was identifying with my grandmother who, can you imagine going to the gas chambers, not being able to protect your young children um, from death? So I, it took me a long time to be able to emotionally be able to write about my mom's experience, sort of separate myself and write about her. So she was in Bergen-Belsen for about a month before the British came in. And here's a sign of the British coming in as part of their truce. There had to be signs erected everywhere on the way, danger, typhus. It was a beautiful, serene countryside. And they came into this really desolate place. This Bergen-Belsen was just, I mean, you can't, uh, well, from what I'm told by people who went through it, it was just unimaginable. I mean, people having very little food and water, no sanitary conditions, no medical care, no habitable housing, just these barracks and thousands upon thousands being dumped. If you know the story of Anne Frank, she died at the end of February or beginning of March. Um, it's hard to pin down exactly when, but my mom arrived at like less than two weeks later, my mom was a few months younger than Anne Frank. So there was a road bisecting the main camp. And this is camp one, which was, there was camp one and camp two. Camp one was called the horror camp where my mom was. Um, and they separated the women and men and in these various sub camps within this camp. It was a huge area. Maybe, maybe the whole thing was like two, around two miles. And what they did on April 12th, I'll just tell you this one story. On April 12th, when the pet truce had been signed, the SS in charge of, in charge of um, Bergen-Belsen decided to organize a parade. And they ordered the inmates who were like half dead to drag those who were dead down this road bisecting the camp to a mass grave at the end. And my mother, um, when she started to tell me about what she experienced in the war. One night we were down in the laundry room of our house and she was talking to me about Auschwitz and telling me how terrible it was. And then she said, Bergen Belsen, she was saying, you know, this was before the word Holocaust was out there, right? She was just talking about the war and what she went through. And she, she Bergen Belsen was, she said, you're not even your, in your worst nightmare. Could you possibly imagine this place? And she put down the iron and she demonstrated for me how she, who was like 50% dead at this point, had to drag bodies by the ankles down a long road to a mass pit. And she said some of them still had their, had their mouth open. And she said to her sister, the only person who survived with her, you know, why do they have their mouth open? And her sister said, because they want so badly to live. And my mother said to her, we all want to live, but I don't think we will. And in fact, some of the people that they were dragging still were breathing. It was just, they were 90% dead, not even 100% dead. It was just horrific. And this effort to clean up the camp, this effort on the part of the SS to have the inmates clean up the camp and get all the corpses in one place because they were right lying around all over had to be abandoned because too many people were dropping dead on the job. So it lasted maybe two, three days. And on April 15th, the British came in to Bergen-Belsen and what they saw shocked them. Glenn Hughes, this hardened military doctor who was a really big war hero from war, World War I, had been in the bloodiest battles, had run onto the battlefield to amputate a soldier's leg if need be. I mean, he was just, Nothing, nothing could faze him. He broke down crying. He broke down crying because he didn't even know in the beginning how he was going to try to save lives. His moral motivation was there. He wanted to try to save as many lives as possible. Came in, surveyed the camp, and I'll just point out a few things to you in this picture. There was about 80... Um, SS who remained in the camp for the transition, the handover. A lot of them tried to run away. Most of them, hundreds of them, got off scot free. Um, here, the um, British soldiers pressed the um, SS into helping to clean up the camp, to 
take the dead bodies, load them into uh, trucks, and mm -hmm. they would be put into these mass graves. There were mass, many, many of these mass graves. Um, there was a backlog, 17,000 people had died in the month of March. And each one of these people, I tremble showing you these photographs because everyone had a life. Everyone was um, either a mother, or a sister, a daughter, a husband, a uncle, everybody had a life. My mother actually met up with her cousin, Rachel Hacked in Bergen-Belsen. Who knows in which mass grave she's buried? Who knows where Anne Frank is buried? Anne Frank, if you were to go to Bergen-Belsen today has her separate own like memorial tombstone, but she's in one of these. And who knows exactly how many people were buried in these mass graves. It was guesswork. There were roughly 60,000 people in the camp when the British came in. There were in the horror camp, in camp one, there were about 40,000. 25,000 were assessed pretty accurately to be in immediate need of medical attention. And more than 13,000 died in the weeks after the British came in. It wasn't like the day of liberation, the sun came out, it was blue skies. It wasn't like that. Like you think of a liberation of some people coming out and cheering and so happy to see the liberators. Yes, some, those, that minority who was in well enough shape, who was able to make it through the war in some capacity where they were privileged and maybe they had food and they were in better shape. But the majority of inmates were just languishing and near death. And it, the complex liberation took weeks. So here it says grave number two, 5,000. Now, of course, there's a much more beautiful monument that says 5,000, but again, it's kind of guesswork because they were dying at an average rate of at least 500 a day after the British came in. And here on the upper right, I just think this picture tells a story because you see this woman here with a square cut out of the back of her coat. And it just shows the measures that were taken to prevent people from trying to escape, um, even on the death marches or whatever. If they have a large hole cut out of the back of their coat, they would be easily identifiable as halfling, as prisoners. My mom had a, it, the same thing cut out of her, the back of her coat. Uh, when she was on the death march. And they had coats and they had some clothing, some of them from the stores that were taken away at the death camps in Poland, in Auschwitz and everything. They brought some of them to these labor camps so people could work and have with a little bit of whatever they needed. So some of them did have coats, but they were had squares cut out the back. Some clever woman, by the way, I, I can't, I can't begin to imagine the amount, not how people resisted, right? So some women saved the fabric and sewed it underneath. It, so all kinds of things went on in quiet ways. So here's a scene of the, from the liberation, um, the squalor. Um, the picture really is horrific, but can't really show how bad it was. Here you see after the liberation, this reminded me of my mother because um, she and her sister were able to get some potatoes and were able to cook. And you could see the background. They're completely inured to human suffering and death everywhere. So um, what the British did is on April 18th, three days after the liberation, they came in um, the 11th Light Field Ambulance and pitched a dump of tentage to get those who were well enough and could walk out of these huts, they called them huts, into these tents so they could maybe access some of the people who were dying in the huts and maybe get them a sip of water. And my mom was one of those who was still ambulatory. If you could still walk, she was uh, sent to a hut with she, a tent, which she shared with four other girls. And she was really sick by this point with tuberculosis and typhus. She didn't know it, but she was very sick and achy. And it was when it was her turn one night to close the flap of the tent door, the, the flap, um, she was too tired and achy and she could not move. So the older girl of the five girls in the hut said to her, 
if you can't do it, you don't belong here. You have to go back. It's, you can't perform your duty. You can't be here. So my mom crawled back from the tent to the hut where, yeah, so she called back. So the distance is kind of interesting to me to see how far was it that she had to crawl. And she was called back to the hut where she was severely beaten up and fell unconscious, beaten by her fellow inmates there. Mm. She would not blame them because she said they were all by that point reduced to like an animal-like state. So how did uh, the British under the leadership of Glenn Hughes go about trying to rescue people. So it had to be done. There was a kind of triage going on and it was um, sort of uh, factory style rescue. So um, the British called the place. There was a, a horse stables about one and a half miles from the main camp and they put people on these, they went into the huts Medics identified people who were still breathing, whom they thought had a chance of life. They marked their foreheads with a red cross and they were taken, lifted. You can see these men in sort of their own version of ham, ham what is it called? Hazmat suits, mm -hmm. protecting protective equipment because everybody was diseased, right? Taking them in what they called contaminated ambulances to what they called the human laundry, which was a stables. And in the human laundry, they set up about 60 tables and they proceeded to, you can see how thin, how skinny this inmate is emaciated to sponge down, clean, wash the inmates that they could and spray them with DDT. And um, yeah, so my mom went through this process too. She was selected um, for the human laundry. And a lot of these women are German nurses that are pressed into service because they were really low on person power. Where were they gonna get all the extra help that was needed for this humanitarian rescue effort? So they had to get people from the region, from the area. So you could imagine that some of the inmates who were conscious enough didn't weren't relish the idea of being handled by German nurses. And the German nurses were originally sort of like giggly. And then they, when they um, saw the task that they were tasked with, became very sad and serious about their job. And uh, British soldiers oversaw the cleaning, the cleansing. So um, here are some approximate numbers. I'll read from the bottom. Um, uh, 14,000 patients were taken through the um, human laundry, patients were in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. The survivors who got to know the brigadier named the hospital complex in the area, the Glenn Hughes Hospital was named for him. It was the largest such facility in Europe on May 19th, 1945. So there were 14,000 patients in the hospital on May 19th. So the liberation was April 19th, so it took more than a month to get all the patients who needed to care to be there. It took two weeks for the backlog of corpses to be buried in Bergen-Belsen. 500 former inmates died each day for a month after the liberation. There was only 361 British Army soldiers and medical personnel working in the relief of Bergen-Belsen two days after the liberation. Glenn Hughes didn't know where he could pull help from. The battles were raging all through Northwest Germany. He had all of his, uh, his regiments, all of his medical personnel were tied up. It was really hard to get in enough personnel. They would have needed 10 times the number of people to, save, to try to save more lives. 750 to 1,000 1, sick were processed each day for over three weeks after the liberation at the Human Laundry the place for washing and disinfecting survivors. I calculate my mom was probably taken to the human laundry probably around April 22nd or 23rd, one of the first ones taken. 25,000 of the inmates when the British arrived were considered fit, which is able to walk. Like if they could walk up like three steps to get into a truck or a van, they were considered fit. They could have still been very sick, right? Um, they suffered from various stages of emaciation. They were transferred to the formerly Wehrmacht transit and rehabilitation barracks. So this was a separate area 
where the well enough survivors were transferred until they could ostensibly be repatriated. Now, it was a very fluid thing because a lot of them fell sick and were taken to the hospital. People in the hospital, if they didn't die, some of them got well enough to go to the um, to this other uh, Wehrmacht barracks, former Wehrmacht barracks. There were 55 to 60,000 sick and dying prisoners found in bergen belsen at the time of its liberation. Two thirds were women, one third men, 400 to 500 were children. And yeah, uh, I'll continue. But um, I should say that the vast majority of these people were Jewish. There were some POWs, Russians and others, but the vast majority were Jews from all over it was amazing to Glenn Hughes that you had people from Poland and Hungary and Lithuania from really all over the continent, practically. So um, the Union Jack, the British flag was a symbol for a victory in Europe day for Glenn Hughes, for the British army. And he would not allow it to be hoisted on May 8th, VE day. He wouldn't, he wouldn't allow it to be hoisted until the last barrack was or hut was evacuated of prisoners. And then there was this big ceremony. Um, and he, here's Glenn Hughes here. He gave the order for this barrack with an effigy of Hitler on it to be torched and burned at a ceremony. And there was a speech about this the British uncovering this hell and what they did to remediate the situation. Here's a sign for the Glenn Hughes Hospital, and this is the main hospital, but there was, it was, there was part of a, a larger complex. So this event, the burning of the hut, here's an actual photograph, and here was a stamp issued by Maldives, this small country off Sri Lanka for the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. It was one of the signs among all these other stamps, one of them was of, this is Hiroshima, but one of them was the liberation of Bergen-Belsen, the burning of the last hut at Belsen. And this evidence had to be burned and got rid of, right? Because there was so much typhus everywhere. So, um, I did a little survey and study of my of people from Siget who arrived in Sweden. The Swedish Red Cross came to Bergen-Belsen and in a humanitarian gesture took in about 7,000 of the really sick survivors aiming to rehabilitate them and put them on their feet and thinking they would be in Sweden for six, seven months and then go on their way. And um, it was, the Swedish government was very wonderful. My mother, my whole life just had such positive feelings. And every survivor I know who was taken to Sweden after the war said the same thing. It was sort of the kindness, the compassion, the lack of bigotry and anti-Semitism, being treated as a human being just in general by the Swedish people was really extraordinary after having endured so much persecution and oppression. So um, very few, so I did this study and it's sort of a little microcosm. It shows sort of the chances of survival depending on the age you were. And so this is the birth year of bells and survivors who were from Siget who arrived in Sweden. Now it's not a really comprehensive study, right? If you could have been from Siget, there were 13,000 Jews deported from Siget. Um, probably less than 2,000 survived the war. They could have been in various places. There's only 167 of them here who were in Bergen-Belsen who were taken to Sweden. There could have been people from Siget who wound up in Bergen-Belsen like my mother who weren't taken to Sweden. There could have been people from Siget who survived in other places. Really 80% to 90% of the Jews from Siget were gassed upon arriving in Auschwitz. Of those who had a chance of survival would be the ones who were in their 20s and 30s and strong who could be taken to, siphoned off from the transports to Auschwitz and taken to labor camps to work for the German Nazi war effort. And you can see here that these survivors are mostly in their 20s and 30s, some in their 30s, very few 40s, very, really impossible almost to survive as an older person, 50s, 60s. 
My mom was among the young ones. She was born in 1929. And you could see that there's very few who were young teenagers, you know, who survived. Maybe if they were lucky, if they had an aunt or older sibling, sister with them who could help protect them. My aunt was born in 1928. My mom was born in 1929 and they were the younger ones. So um, they were kind of naive and, um, but teenagers, sometimes if they had a chance of survival, fared, maybe they could begin their life all over again. When my mother was really sick and dying in a hospital, she felt that she had not yet lived her life. She was only 15. She really fought to pull through. Every day, by the way, in her makeshift hospital room in Bergen-Belsen, there were 13, 12 beds. Every day, they took out 11 dead and brought in 11 nearly dead. And that was the situation. And she was the 12th person. And she just hung on, hung on, hung on. So my mom, after the war, was taken to... Um, a place called Katrina home. She was first taken to a, a quarantine setting and then they were farmed out the survivors to these small schools in different parts of, of uh, Sweden. And here's my mom. This is the very first picture we have of her. You can still see black and blue marks. She was in the vacant look in her eye. This was the first place where she got individualized med personal medical attention. And these are all young teenage girl survivors who have TB who are in this hospital. And this doctor, Dr. Leffler, uh, nursed my mom through one night when she was on death's door. So uh, my book, I also talk about what happened after the war, uh, both to my mom and to the brigadier. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Glenn Hughes at bergen and You can see the serious look in his eyes, the intense, intense, look and sadness and grief. And here he is later, he was a great sportsman. Someone could write a whole biography of Glenn Hughes and rugby football and golf in England. And he was also a medical or, uh, administrator. And he did, some, he did some extraordinary things later in life. And I think they're connected to his, what he witnessed and experienced in Bergen-Belsen. And um, here's my mom after the war in Sweden with her sister, her only relative who survived. Uh, she marries my father in 1955, and here's a picture of my father. He's also a survivor who's in a displaced persons camp, and here's my mom today. She's about to turn 92 years old tomorrow. We'll have a birthday celebration for her here in Boston, um, where I live. She's from New York, and my granddaughter is also born on October 8th, so we'll have a dual celebration. It will be hopefully lovely. Um, do I have time to tell you a little bit about another chapter in Bergen Belsen, or would you like to stop for questions? Whoops, I can't I can't hear you, Ron. I'm sorry. I'd like to hear about what you have to say next. Yeah, you can you can go on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So one one of the soul turning experiences Glenn Hughes had in the summer, right after the liberation, was the way he was, he kept going to the camp, even when his responsibilities ended, he kept going there like every day. And this chapter does not involve my mom. This was involving the survivors who remained in Bergen-Belsen and formed a DP camp. So while mourning incalculable losses, survivors, nearly all of whom who had lost most of their relatives formed a vibrant displaced persons community. The devout and the secular, those who had lost faith and those who held fast to Jewish precepts united around a common goal, to create a meaningful narrative of their sufferings by turning their sights to a Jewish homeland and to a future in which they could live normal lives. So while some of the survivors from like Western Europe, from Holland or France might have tried to go home, people from Poland and Hungary, from Eastern Europe, from Romania, from Czechoslovakia, they, it was, there was no home to go back to. Like it was just all their family had been murdered, their communities were gone. So they, they formed this displaced community. Uh, it was probably the largest and most dynamic and it amounted in a few years to about 12,000 people in Bergen-Belsen in a DP camp. 
and they were advocating for being able to go to Palestine where they could at least hope to live a normal life um, where they wouldn't be prey to murderous anti-Semitism. So here's uh, members of this Jewish brigade soldiers coming to Bergen-Belsen to visit the displaced persons who were just like amazed to see Jewish soldiers in a uniform. And here are people lobbying to please open the gates of British authorities should open the gates of Palestine. And this was very political. The British did not want to hear of this. Like they just wanted people to go back, go back to your homes. But there were no homes to go back to. So where were no, the countries weren't like opening their doors and welcoming these refugees. So here, this uh, man is named Yussel Rosensaft. He's an, um, uh, he emerged as a leader as a, among the survivors and he was a uh, short, minute, small man and he was a powerful, powerful uh, leader and who, who got an article in the New York Times and who really pushed for a lot of, a lot of things to happen. And he and Glenn Hughes formed a relationship. Glenn Hughes was totally taken with this dynamo. There were other things going on in the displaced persons camp. Um, and this was all very impressive to Glenn Hughes. Very quickly, they formed a theater group, a Kazat, which means concentration camp theater, where these actors and actresses reenacted scenes from their immediate wartime experience of being ghettoized and what did it mean and being mothers and cry a child crying when he's separated from his mother and you would have an audience of like a couple of thousand people in tears crying it was sort of cathartic and at the displaced persons camp the or the organization for rehabilitation and training came in and tried to train these survivors whose education had been so disrupted for future careers whether seamstresses or in um some kind of technical trade or mechanics, there was a lot of training going on to prepare them. And it was a very complex situation in the DP camp because um, people, most of the survivors, right, were in their 20s and 30s, and many of them had been married before the war and had, they didn't know if their spouse had survived or what happened. In many cases, they just didn't know. So the ketubah, the Jewish marriage contract that the rabbis drew up had to have some provision in it. If you're going to get married and people were looking to pair up and get married right away. Not my mom, right? She was a kid still, but she observed this even before she was taken to Sweden. You know, people were trying to make themselves look presentable. They, they had lost so much and they were pairing up and they wanted to form families. They wanted to live a normal life very quickly after the war. It was like the largest, one year after the war saw like the largest baby boom in human history in the DP camp. So 420 men and 300 women who had been married and did not know the fates of their spouses were granted permission to remarry with the caveat that if their spouse showed up, there would be some provisions for them monetary or materially or whatever. So here's a picture from like two, three years into the DP camp, because it was a place where people were waiting. It was like they were waiting, waiting, waiting to see if they could get into Palestine, where they could go. And they had a social life and they everybody was having babies. There was a parade of trams, of ba uh, prams, baby carriages. So you could just see the life revolved around these small children. They had a little kindergarten. Right away, they set up these schools for them. So this was happening. It, um, it was just an amazing story of sort of renewal from the remnants, from the ashes. And this is a video of um, Rabbi Tzvi Asariah Herman Halfgott, who was a POW in Yugoslavia, who came to Bergen-Belsen to help out immediately after the war. And I'll let you listen to him. It's in Hebrew. So. Okay. 
כולם יחד. כן. כלומר, שורה אחת, נגיד, עשרים שלושים, על זה כן סיד, כן, ועל זה שוב כן איזה שלושים עשרים וזה, כמו שהיה ב, ב, <coughs> במחנה המוות הזה, איפה שאלפים כן. אבל יום אחד ניגשה אל האישה ואמרה לי, רבי, שמעתי היום שבבלוך הזה וזה, ביתי נפטרה. אז אמרתי, אז מה לעשות? אני רוצה קבר בשבילה, קבר יחיד. אמרתי, אבל זה בלתי אפשרי. אבל לכן אני מבקשת ממך. אז אמרתי לה, את יודעת מה? בלילה כשחיילים בדרך כלל האנגלים נמצאים במועדונים, אז אנחנו נגבור אותם. אנחנו נביא, נביא את הגופה ואנחנו כן נגבור אותם. ובאמת, בלילה היא קמה מהמיטה, ואני ניסיתי מהר מהר לגבור אותה, קדיש להגיד, ופתאום כשאני רציתי כבר לסתום את הגולם, היא אומרת לי, רגע אחד רבי. והיא פנתה עם העיניים לשמיים ואמרה, ריבונו של עולם, ביידיש, אני מודה, אני מודה לך לזכות הגדולה שנתת לי היום לקבור את ביתי במו ידיי. אמן. מרגע זה אני מוכרח להגיד, נעשיתי אדם אחר. עשינו עכשיו את הכל על מנת לעזור לאנשים כן, בדרך לחיים. ופה התחלנו לאשכול לדאוג, היו כמה ילדים לגן ילדים, ואחר כך להקים בית ספר, כן. פה עזרו לו, לנו הרבה אנשי בריגדה שהגיעו כבר בזמן הזה, כן, לברגן ברסן גם כן. והקמנו כבר גם כן תיאטרון, כן. חיים חדשים התחילו, כן. ופה אני עסקתי עד ארבעים ושמונה, כן, פה בתורה, חתונות התחילו, כן, ברית מילות, כן, וכולי 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 וכולי. ואני לא צריך להדגיש כמה שאני הייתי מאושר. כל משפחה רצתה שבברית מילה שאני נתתי לכולם בקופה וקידושים שאני אחזיק את הילד. היום המאושר ביותר בחיים שלי היה בילד האלף כשאני החזקתי לידיו, הילד האלף. אני עברתי יום יום מבלוק לבלוק לראות מי נפטר. So um, that is my presentation. This was sign was erected immediately after the liberation. or within a few weeks, uh, it's not there now, but if you ever traveled to Northwest Germany to go to Bergen-Belsen, they now have a very fine museum with a lot, of, a lot of good information there. And I'm always happy to answer any questions. Here's my email and it has a way for you to get in touch with me and I'm happy to answer any questions now. So I'm now gonna stop the presentation. Let's go back. Uh, thank you so much, Bernice. Um, you know, needless to say, it's an incredible story. The stories of survivors and what happened, we hear, you know, we've heard over the years, but we need to keep on hearing them. And they're all unique. And the story of your mother and, uh, and then what uh, the British uh, doctor did and what the British did after that's another aspect that I don't think many people are aware of. And thank you for helping us understand that. So if there are questions, You can either say them, you know, jump in or put it in the chat and I'll relay them. I do have one question. Um, I was wondering um, who your mother married, if he was also um, involved in Belgium or any of the other camps. No, my father, um, my father was uh, in something called Hungarian forced labor um, and Uh, she married, yeah, she married him 10 years after the war, um, but she knew his sisters because 
uh, she didn't really know his sisters, but his sisters knew her because they were in labor camp together. So um, yeah, so um, that's how she got connected to him. It's like her sister and uh, my father's sisters met at a party and like, you have a single you know, brother, I have a single brother, you have a single sister, let's see if we can get them together. So this was a kind of matchmake thing. And uh, my father was then living in the United States. My mother was living in Sweden and he flew over to meet her and they got married. So, but he has his own really big story that I'm starting to research now. That's cool. And uh, I, I think it's cool that she experienced something so natural and so uh, normal for most people. So uh, thank you so much for that information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my mom went, on, my mom went on to lead a kind of normal, productive life. I mean, she spent, she would say that she lost her best years as a teenager and young adult because she was so sick a lot of the time. She was in and out of TB sanatoriums for ten years, but after that, after Sweden, when she came to this country, she had married my father. They came, you know, she set up her life here. She was lucky. She had a lot of years of good health living in this country, and she had. Um, she helped my father in his business. And then she worked for like 25 years at Bloomingdale's. So she had a lot of fun doing that. May I ask uh, all the stories that you heard from, from your mom, how did they affect you in your life? Well, you know, when you're, every survivor is different, right? And every child of survivor is different. So I had this unusual give and take with my mom, which a lot of people don't have. Sometimes survivors are afraid, you know, they don't want to burden their children. They don't want to tell them what happened. Sometimes the children don't want to ask. They don't want to bring their parents back to a painful place. But we always had this pretty much this organic kind of back and forth. And it just makes you really um, sensitive to everything like when you read the news like I, if I and I was lucky because I still have my mom like sometimes we'll talk about what's going on in the news and we still have the same like just you know it just makes you super hypersensitive like I'll just give you an example a very recent example like I'm now starting to research my father's life um, you know figuring out certain things about him and he escaped and I said to my mother, well, where did he like eat? Where did he sleep? He was hunted. The war was still raging. He was hunted by the Hungarians, by the German SS, by the Russians. He could have been in a, taken to camp. He could have been shot. And, you know, what did he, where did he go? He was in rags and he was emaciated. And she said, you don't have to look that far. She said, you can look at what's happening in certain areas of the world. You could see some of the images that we're seeing from Afghanistan. You know, you just, it helps you, you know, you can, it, you take it sort of, you can imagine what is to be caught in the wrong place in time and history. Like you're an innocent human being, just, you could be just like not even an extraordinary person. You're just an ordinary person trying to live your life and you're just caught up in the politics or events or wrong place. And you're just born at the wrong time and these terrible, context or you have to navigate somehow so you become very sensitive to what's going on around you thanks for sharing that did your um um thank you very much first of all for this um incredible presentation um so glad to have been able to participate um i um i'm curious if your mom has actually read the book because I mean, it's one thing to tell the story and have this conversation and back and forth, as you said, organically with your daughter. And it's another thing to actually read it in print. And I'm curious if that's something that she's done or has any desire to do, or even if you want her to. Well, first she read every chapter draft, right? She read, you know, it went back and forth. And I'll never forget, like we were at the airport, I think we were coming back from Alaska. This is many years ago, because the book took, took me like 12 years to write. So we were at the airport and I just had finished a draft of the chapter about her family at home. And I gave it to her to read. I wanted her to correct anything I could have misconstrued. 
and I saw that she was really tearing up and she's not that emotional. And it's terrible because I never want to cause her any kind of pain. But on the other hand, as a writer who had to kind of remove myself, I knew I got it right because, because it evoked that kind of reaction in her. I knew that I captured something about her siblings, about her parents, something she was feeling. So I did, she read every chapter draft and she read the whole book and I gave it to her, even the proofs when the publisher was doing the final edits. And then later she would say, I'll just tell you another little funny thing. She would say, well, she read the book now and you know, after it's published, like after it's published, she said, mm, I wouldn't say it exactly that way. And I'm saying, <laughs> like she knows, she said, she, she said, I didn't want to, I didn't want to correct it at the time because I didn't want to give you more work to do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but she definitely has read it and yeah and she learned from it she didn't really know what happened when she fell unconscious she never understood the bigger picture of the rescue or yeah so thank you thank you bless her for her birthday tomorrow uh, <laughs> yeah that's wonderful that's wonderful i have i have a comment and a question if that's okay sure yeah. Sure, go ahead. Okay, from, um, you said something about, you just mentioned the word in passing about politics. From what I've read, um, when Roosevelt was president, you know, was president a few times, and uh, of course, Pope Pius, I think was also in the picture then, they were two very, very powerful men. Uh, from what I understand, the State Department was quite anti-Semitic at the time. And also, I believe that Roosevelt really could have done a lot more and Pope Pius too. I was wondering, did, you, did your mother ever mention anything about like powerful countries such as the US and, and well, the Pope anyway, not really you know, doing at least quite a bit more than they did and maybe perhaps Thousands would have been saved, at least thousands, if not more. Well, I visited the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I've been three times. <laughs> so there's a letter there. Um, I think it, there's a letter there about Rose. I don't know if it's to Roosevelt or from Roosevelt. And when she read it, she was just so angry. Yeah, so right. So yeah. angry. Why couldn't they do anything? I mean, yeah. I mean, there were so many different Holocausts within the Holocaust and right. Aryan Jews at the end, by that time, the world knew. Yeah, the world certainly knew, yeah. Yeah, she was so angry. And I have to tell you, I just finished like a biography of Roosevelt and I was like, he was, first of all, last year of the war, he was really out of commission. He was so sick. Yeah, right. And he was just like, at one point he made like a public service announcement on the radio urging people in like Hungary to hide people if they could to try to hide the Jews try to hide the Jews and I was like are you kidding me like right. you think these poor people most of them have radios do you know what the you know I I, I was just so yeah. mad you know um and I might I have a question now because um yeah I'm just wondering if Truman, who was a different type of character, might have done something different, but you can't go back. I mean, you don't know, but. Oh, no, you can't go back, but but it's definitely, we have definitely to study. Definitely a lot of anger, a lot of, a lot of rage. In fact, I'm doing a, pro, I'm doing a program soon with, um, I don't know if you know uh, the name Rudolf Verba. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rudolf Verba. Oh, we, yeah. we had his, uh, his wife gave a presentation for us. Oh, she did. So yeah. I'm doing something yeah. jointly with oh. Robin Verba. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Robin, yeah. Robin lives right near us. Uh, I live in Fall River, Mass. And Robin just moved from New York to uh, Riverside, Long Island. And her mom, who is was the mother-in-law of, what's his name, Ru Rudy? Rudy, Rudy. Yeah. Rudy Ver yeah. Uh, yeah, she lives with her, too. Oh. And, and I know Robin and I know her mother very well. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, so that's great. So anyway, Robin and I are doing something jointly soon. Oh, something yeah. that we could um, get connect with. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's there's going to be a, um, 
information about it on my website. Great, and I'm in touch with you. Uh, Rini and I take Hebrew lesson every once a week with our rabbi, so I see her weekly. <laughs> I can find out about it as well. Yeah. yeah. If you I, um, if you do have a connection, could you send it to me, and then we can publicize it? Sure, yeah. it's through oh. the White Plains Jewish Center. I could try to do that. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. I I do want to. Uh, I mean, the whole situation with Roosevelt is complex, but towards the end of the war. We did get more involved, and actually, we helped to uh, fund the country, helped to fund uh, Wallenberg, and the work that Wallenberg did was the Swedes in saving uh, at least, the, especially the Jews in in uh, Budapest. So there was some effort to be made, although it was late in the game. I so yeah. as usual, it's a complex <laughs> situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. But just can you maybe talk a little bit about the research? Because you know, you obviously talk to your mother. But, uh, you know, like uh, Arch Spiegelman, who did Mouse, he did a lot of research around it. It sounds like you did the same thing. So could you probably talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, um, so my mom's story. So I knew the contours of where she was. So I could just really go deep into um, what was going on at the various places. I read every testimony. She was in the Christian Stat labor camp. So I read everything written by anyone about that labor camp. And yeah, I, I, and then there was a second part to my research, which was the brigadier, who I knew nothing about, and I knew nothing about British military history, and I didn't, but I was curious about how did he get from where he was to Bergen-Belsen, like, what was going on, like, what was he concerned about, what was he thinking about, what kind of character was he, what was written about him, what did he write, um, how did he process the experience, what what were his talents? What were his flaws? So I started to um, get very deep into his life. The first thing I did was when I got the idea and I was thinking about writing it about him, I flew to London. I met with his daughter. I started to try to track down every living person who knew who, who knew him and um, yeah, do some interviews with people. And I spent, I went to London and to England several times and, you know, went to the Imperial War Museum and the National Archives and the Royal Army Medical Corps Museum. And I went, I went a little bit crazy as sometimes the biographers are wont to do, right? We go down all these primrose paths because we think everything's interesting even though the reader might not. And in the end, we have to cut a lot of things from our manuscript. But I even went like to the archives, the transcript office where he went to medical school to see his records and to figure out why this brilliant student, you know, was failing his first year of medical school and then tracing it to his involvement with the University College Hospital rugby football team and how involved he was with that. So there was, I did a lot of research. A lot, you do a lot and then you have to trim, trim, trim and only give the reader like a smidget, like the little tip of the iceberg. Yeah, well, th thank you. I think it's important for people to understand that when a book like this is written or any, you know, that it involves not only the memory of, of the survivor, which is essential, but also everything around it. And so uh, it takes that kind of research to really get a narrative that, you know, is close to reality as possible. Yeah. Right, which sounds very much like you did. Yes. Do you know, is your book going to be, in, uh, it's how, is it going to be in paperback? Is it easily accessible? Um, it's, I don't know if it's going to be in paperback, but it's in audio and Kindle and it can be gotten from libraries everywhere. Yeah. In fact, if you ask your library to purchase it, I'd be grateful. Um, yeah. All the horrors of war. It can be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, uh, our, our center, is our library at our college is developing a whole part of their library for our the works on the Holocaust and other genocide. So we will be for sure purchasing your book if we haven't already done so and have that as part of it. But so people could also buy it directly through uh, Amazon, right? Or Jack? Or Amazon. John. They could buy it through Amazon directly. And I can even... If you want, if anybody's interested in buying it through Johns Hopkins University Press, I can give you a 30% off discount code. 
Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, so Johns Hopkins University Press, the discount code, if you want to purchase it through them, is H-T-W-N. A-T-W-N? -A H. H is in Howard. Oh, H. H. T W. I'll type it in the message. H -T -W okay. W N and right. discount code. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, we will. I, if we did this in person, we'd have a book signing. But this is yeah. the next best thing. I hope people. You know, your your talk was amazing, and we want. I'm sure people would be interested in reading the reading, and we'll clearly have it in our library as well. Thank you. Um, okay. Are there other questions before we? I don't know how to, I don't, I don't, somehow it's not going through. Um, so, yeah, we don't have it. Somebody, oh, Pauline was saying thank you so much for the meaningful presentation. Uh, thank you. I'm and also the DC Museum did have an exhibit. It still may be there, you know, of the uh, FDR administration and their involvement. So. Again, that's a <coughs> complex story. Yes, yes. And also the role of the church. And uh, there's books coming out now that the uh, archives have been open dealing with the role of uh, Pope Paul XII. Uh, yeah. And Judy Brown said, thank you so much for your incredible family story. Oh, thank you. I know you. she's working on one herself. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. That's great. I'd be interested in hearing about it. And um, Kathleen Pearl, who's our dean of our uh, of our um, social science and education department, she said thank you as well. Uh, and by the way, that was Pope Pius. I think you said Pope Paul. Oh, Pope Pius, you're right. Pope Sorry. Pius, what, was it the twelfth? I think twelfth. Yeah, Pope oh. Pius the twelfth. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If you, the more you read and study, I've done some. You know, there's always more and more and more one can do. But they missed a lot of opportunities to to do a lot more than they did, yeah. and I think it was intentional, but based on my reading. Well, yeah, it's background. It's a complex story to say at least. Not bad, not with the roses. I don't think so. But anyway, that's <laughs> not right now. Okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, Dr. Lerner, thank you so much for your presentation. Yes, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for everyone who signed on today. You. Yeah. And I, I want, I'm very much interested in seeing your work with Robin. Um, right? Does she use the last name Verber? Or yes, Verber? yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah, I'm very interested in that. <clears throat> yeah, his story, uh, his autobiography is an amazing one as yeah. well. You, you had a, a video about him, right? Didn't we you? do, yeah. We oh, I, I saw it, I saw yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Very um, interesting, huh? Yes, yes. Uh, the stories coming out of the show, uh, or the Holocaust is uh, endless, endless, yeah. and they're all important. Everyone is all important, right. and so again, the, you know, the story, and each person, as you, as you say, uh, Doctor Lerner, each person is an individual. Yeah, you know, yeah. not a statistic. Is an individual. Right. Your mother was an individual, yeah. as your father was, yeah. and their yeah. their family, and that's yeah. the way we have to look at it as well as a bigger picture. Yes, that's right. Um, we will. Um, I see Pauline. Get your, never get your pronunciation right, uh, Pauline, but you're up next at the end of the month. Yes, uh, it's um, it gets on, Ron. Get sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But <laughs> That's okay. That's all I, right. I, if you want to give a quick plug to your, uh, uh, we will, we have flyers out already and we'll be doing more publicity, but if you want to say anything. As we well, I I was it was an honor actually to just be here for Dr. Lerner's um, presentation and to learn more about her mom and um, and the story that uh, of the horrors that she experienced. Um, as all of you have said, it's so important for us to understand um, these horrific crimes against humanity and there's always more to learn and I hope that with my presentation on the Armenian genocide and my family story that it will um, lend more to the conversation as well so I hope you'll all be able to join me um, then and um, 
and I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you there. <laughs> It'll be this type of presentation. I agree with Dr. Lerner. It would have been nice to be in person, but I understand the caution involved, certainly. And, I'm looking uh, forward to seeing you too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paula. And any problems that we had a little, you know, technical thing, some people did with Evan Bright. We'll try yes. to figure that out if, if there's a way okay. to figure it out. But it's great. It turned turned out all right because we got many people here oh, and you yes. are here and uh, it works out. Yes. <laughs> a little stress at the beginning, that's all. So thank you so much and thank everybody for, thank you, Ron. for, thank you. for coming. Okay. And um, our Holocaust and Genocide Center continues to do presentations of, say, in the uh, fall. We have two more and we'll have others in the spring. Uh, we're also working, uh, Gary Brown, myself, Marsha Anifrak, working on professional development with uh, regional teachers. We have a whole project Great. going on. So we're, Great. We're, doing, we're doing what we can, especially at the rise of anti-Semitism, other forms uh -huh. of racism. We have to do this kind of education uh, yeah. if we're, if we're yeah. going to head, head off another uh, tragedy. So yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you, Ron. Thank okay. You. And thank you, Dr. Take care. And thank you, Gary, for... Uh, hosting our, uh, our, our, our Zoom. Thank you. Stay well, everyone. Yeah. Take care. And we'll be in touch, uh, uh, Bernice. Yes. Thank well. you so much. Yeah. And send us a verb if you can. That'd be great. I will. I okay. will. Take Thank care. You. Thank bye you. Bye.